This is the lecture for medical terminology, chapter three, bones. Here are some important notes. You should always refer to your textbook, and this video is merely a resource, so it shouldn't be the only source of information when it comes to studying for the exam. There is going to be more information contained in this video presentation than you actually need for the exam. Uh, however, the most relevant topics are highlighted in red. I have also tried to follow the flow of the textbook with references to the figures and pages in the text. Um, while you may not be tested on all information, it's important to note that you may need some of this information in your everyday practice. And there is no commercial content in this video. It's only for educational purposes. Let's talk about the skeletal system. The skeletal system is made up of bones, joints, and support in connective tissue. The skeleton in the adult human contains 206 bones. In the infant, or neonate, it's about 350. And the reason is, many of the bones that are fused and have become one bone in an adult are actually not fused yet in a neonate or infant. Turning to page 65 of the textbook, we can talk about the functions of bones. The uh, firm framework of the body actually supports the organs and prevents certain hollow organs from collapsing on itself. Um, they protect delicate structures such as the brain and spinal cord. We have the cranium that protects the brain and the vertebral column that protects the spinal cord. Um, the bones work as levers to produce movement because the muscles pull on the bones in order to produce movement. The, a hard structure is needed for the muscles to actually move the body. Bones are a reservoir of calcium and phosphorus salts. These are also known as minerals. And a very important function of bones is to produce blood cells. Not just red blood cells, but white blood cells and platelets as well. There are a couple different types of bone cells. Osteoblasts are cells that make bone. Osteocytes maintain and repair the bone. Osteoclasts actually break bones down. And you might want to know why is there cells that actually build and break bones down? Because bones are a dynamic tissue, they're being broken down and rebuilt constantly. Ossification is the conversion of cartilage into bone. In the neonate, most of the bones are quite soft. The majority of it is very cartilage-like. Cartilage is a uh, soft, elastic type substance that most people know form the ears and the nose. So you'll find some quick questions here to check your understanding which of these is a bone building cell and we can see we have the answer here which is an osteoblast. Let's talk about bone structure. So we have a couple types of bone tissue. We have compact bone. Compact bone is what forms the shafts of the long bones. It's actually fairly hard. Uh, spongy bone or cancellous bone is looks like a sponge on microscopic appearance. There are holes in the bones. Um, these are usually found at the ends of the bones. And these cancellous or spongy bone contain bone marrow. Bone marrow is of two types. Uh, there's red bone marrow that actually is hemopoietic tissue, meaning that red bone marrow produces blood cells. Yellow marrow, on the other hand, is red marrow that has become inactive and has, be con has been converted to fat. Uh, the great thing is that yellow marrow, when it's needed, can be reverted back to red marrow. And we also talk about bone membranes.
The membrane that surrounds the bone itself is called the periosteum. Meanwhile, the membrane that lines the inner cavity or medullary cavity of the bone is called the endoosteum. Here we have a diagram showing the difference between spongy bone and compact bone and their locations. This diagram is very similar to the diagram on page 65, figure 3.1. These are some, this is a structure of a typical bone basically. You would notice that the ends of the bones are covered with cartilage and those are called articular cartilage. Those help the bones articulate or move within the joint. It actually provides some cushioning. You would notice that the ends of the bone are called epiphyses. Epiphyses, we have a proximal and a distal epiphysis, whereas the bone shaft is known as the diaphysis. Here we can also note the location of spongy bone containing the red marrow. We can note the endoosteum, which is in the medullary cavity. You notice that the medullary cavity contains uh, blood vessels and nerves. We notice that the yellow marrow can also be found in, in the medullary cavity and that the tissue or membrane surrounding the bone itself is called the periosteum. Okay, let's talk a little bit about bone markings. You can find these on page 66 under the heading anatomic landmarks of bones. Um, we have projections, for example, the head of a bone, uh, a process, condyle, crest, or spine. Uh, let's talk about a process. A process is usually a projection from the surface of a bone that serves an, as an attachment for a muscle or tendon. And the textbook gives you an example of the mastoid process. Uh, we can also talk about the head of the femur. The head of the femur is actually the part of the bone that sits in the socket, the hip socket, also known as the acetabulum. Uh, we can go on actually for a very long time talking about bone markings. There are several different types of bone markings depending on their shape. Uh, for example, ends of a bone that have a rounded projection is known as a condyle. And a great example of a condyle is the uh, knuckles and also the elbow. So the elbow itself is not an, a separate bone like the knee. The elbow is really um, known as the olecranon process. It's a condyle of the ulna. We can talk about depressions or holes in bones. Uh, foramens are usually large holes that facilitate the passage of nerves and blood vessels. For example, the foramen magnum is where the spinal cord connects to the brain and so connect to the brain. Um, sinuses, which can be found in the skull, uh, make the skull lighter and actually allow the voice to resonate. Uh, so we have a bunch of different sinuses in the skull. When we talk about the uh, structure of the skull, you'll see pictures showing the different sinuses. Uh, fossa is uh, just a depression, and a meatus is uh, usually a smaller hole than a foramen. Uh, example of a meatus is what's called the external auditory meatus. That is the hole in the skull that um, allows us allows the passage of sound into the ear. Joints. Joints are classified by their degree of movement that's permitted. Fibrous joints, such as sutures in adults and fontanelles in infants, um, permit very limited movement. Sutures in adults actually don't move at all. Sutures are found in the skull, and basically there were spots where their bones were not joined. Fontanelles are the soft spot in the skull of uh, infants and newborns, and they allow for the passage of the infant through the birth canal, 
and also for the growth of the brain. Cartilaginous joints are made of cartilage, for example, where the ribs connect to the sternum and the pubic symphysis. When we study the pelvis, you'll see the pubic symphysis actually allows a little bit of movement to facilitate childbirth in the female. Uh, synovial joints are the most complex and the most movable joints in the body. Examples are the hips and shoulders, and the hips and shoulders are actually known as ball and socket joints. Basically, you have a head of a bone going into a socket to make the joint. Uh, knees and elbows are a different type of synovial joint, and these are called hinge joints. There's several different types of synovial joints, and they're, they're classified by their structure, they're classified by um, how much they allow the joints to move. Basically, we can, we can talk a lot about synovial joints, but what interests us most is the general structure of the synovial joint. Um, the bones are joined by other structures in the synovial joints. Um, from one bone to the next, we have several fibrous cords, very strong fibrous cords called ligaments that connect one bone to the next. Surrounding this entire joint is also a fibrous capsule called the joint capsule. And we have the haline or cartilage and the synovial membrane. The haline cartilage is uh, the articular cartilage that are on the ends of the bone. It, it actually allows some cushioning and some shock absorption as well. And the synovial membrane is actually part of that haline cartilage. It produces uh, synovial fluid. Synovial fluid actually separates the two bones in the, uh, in the joint space itself because the bones aren't actually touching each other. The synovial uh, fluid does a lot for um, cushioning uh, and um, shock absorption. The meniscus, or um, singular is meniscus, plural is menisci, articular discs. Um, the meniscus usually separates the, the joint cavity into medial and lateral parts. And you should refer to page 67, figure 3.3. 3. There's also um, a certain amount of fat in the, uh, in the joint called intra-articular fat. And again, that serves uh, to cushion the joint as well. And they're bursae. So what exactly are these um, bursae? Bursae is plural. Um, bursa is singular. So they're basically fibrous sacs that acts as cushions um, to ease movement. And they're found all over uh, in the shoulder, in the elbow, and the knee, usually where a tendon passes over a bone. Here we see the structure of a synovial joint. We see the joint capsule um, and the ligaments. We can also visualize uh, the articular cartilage and you see we have the greater trochanter of the femur that's one of those bone markings that um, that we mentioned it's important to know some of these bone landmarks because physicians make references to them but if you're working in this particular specialty that's something that you can become more familiar with. Types, types of synovial joints is something that I alluded to earlier. We have gliding, hinge, pivot, condyloid, saddle, and ball, and socket joints. The most important are the hinge and ball and socket joints for our purposes. And here we have a quick question to check understanding. What type of joint is your elbow? And on the next slide, our answer, it's a hinge joint. Okay, let's talk about major bones of the skeleton. 
we have our cranium which is the brain box um, we have our facial bones and the um, only movable bone in the skull let's talk about the structure of the skeleton the cranium is the brain box we have our facial bones and the only movable bone in the skull which is the mandible the clavicle is the collarbone the sternum is the breastbone notice that the ribs connect to the breastbone uh, the scapula is the shoulder blade the main bone of the upper arm is the humerus and the forearm actually has two bones the radius and the ulna notice that the radius is on the thumb or lateral side the ulna is on the medial side the bones of the wrists are called carpals there are eight of them the bones that make up the hand are called metacarpals the bones that make up the finger are phalanges the bones that make up uh, the spinal column are the vertebra the hip bone is the ilium and we'll go into greater detail uh, of the structure of the hip the longest bone in the body is the femur the strongest bone in the body is the femur notice that we have a bone that actually forms the kneecap that is the patella the fibula the fibula is the smaller bone on the lateral aspect of the lower leg the tibia is the shin bone the tarsals form the ankle similarly the carpals form the wrist however the tarsals form the ankle if you notice the largest of the tarsal bones is the calcaneus the calcaneus is the heel bones the bones of the foot are the metatarsals very similarly the bones of the hand were metacarpals the bones of the foot are metatarsals and the toes are also known as phalanges here we have a couple of checkpoints to check your understanding a couple of questions that you can contemplate and answer yourselves okay so generally speaking when we study the skeleton we divide it into two main sections the axial skeleton and that's 80 bones of the head and trunk and the appendicular skeleton from the word appendage because that's basically what the arms and legs are the arms and legs also known as the extremities 126 bones of the extremities and when you add those together you get your 206 bones of the normal adult skeleton now we're going to discuss the framework of the skull the cranial bones are made up of uh, eight bones the facial bones 14 bones I'm not going to require you to know all 14 of those just a couple of the main ones however I do ask that you memorize the eight cranial bones the bones of the middle ear which are six bones we'll speak more of the bones of the middle ear shortly um, actually the smallest bone in the body is found in the middle ear it is called the stapes and in the infant skull we have fontanelles fontanelles are soft spots where the bones of the skull have not been fused as yet here are the bones that form the framework of the skull the frontal bone forms the forehead 
If you follow along page 71 of your textbook, you can see these bones. Uh, there also is a, uh, a diagram on page 70. The parietal bones are the largest bones in the skull. They actually form the sides of the head. Um, the temporal bones are actually right below the uh, parietal bones. The occipital bone basically forms the back of the skull. And that leaves us with the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone is basically a light spongy bone at the roof and sides of the nose. It separates the nasal cavity from the brain and it actually forms a part of the orbit. The orbit is basically the eye socket. Um, that leaves us with the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone is a, it's actually irregularly shaped, a bone at the base of the skull. It makes contact with all the other cranial bones and it forms the base of the cranium, the sides of the skull, and the floors and sides of the eye socket. When we look at the diagram shortly, that will become clear. If you note the uh, colors of the bones, that will help you to distinguish which one is which. Okay, continuing on, we're going to talk about the mandible, which is actually the jawbone, and it's the only movable bone in the skull. It is attached to the skull via the temporal mandibular joint, um, also commonly known as TMJ. The bones here noted in red, the mandible, the maxillae, the zygomatic, and nasal bones are the bones that um, I require you to know. Let's talk about the, um, the maxilla. The maxillary bones, there are two of them, they form the upper jaw. The zygomatic bones are the cheekbones. The nasal bones, the nasal bones form the upper part of the nose bridge. The, um, the lacrimal bones make up part of the eye sockets and actually lacrimal means tear producing. And if you notice the lacrimal bones are actually right about where the tear ducts would be. The vomer bone forms the base of the nasal septum. In other words, the nasal septum is attached to the vomer, and you should note that the nasal septum itself is made of cartilage. The palatine bones, there are two of them, um, form the front of the hard palate of the mouth and also the floor of the nose. There's also two inferior nasal conchae and they are thin scroll-like bones that form part of the interior of the nose. The ossicles, which are the incus, the malleus, are in the inner ear, and they're discussed in a, another chapter. If we look at this diagram of the skull, we can actually get a better understanding of where where the different bones are located. Um, if you follow the, the color pattern and the color key, you'll see in purple we have the frontal bone and I guess lavender or we have the occipital bone. In yellow we have the mandible. Um, in beige we have uh, the parietal bone. In red we have our um, temporal bone. In yellow, we have the sphenoid bone. Uh, we have our zygomatic bones in white. So follow along either with this diagram or the one in your textbook. I'd like you to note the sutures. We have the coronal sutures, the uh, sagittal suture, the lomboidal suture, the squamous suture. Okay, so these sutures are the fibrous joints that we spoke of, um, and there's very, there's actually no movement in the adult. However, these were, these were the spots where the bones were separated, and the sutures are the spots where the bones actually uh, 
have now come together and fully fused in the adult. This is a uh, inferior view of the skull that can actually give you a good idea of the where the maxilla and the palatine bones form the hard palate. You can also get a, a very good view of the vomer and the sphenoid bones as well. This diagram shows the floor of the cranium. Basically, the cranium is cut in half. And we're looking at it uh, superiorly. So we're basically looking at the sphenoid bone. So since the sphenoid bone is, is on the inside, and it's very hard to, to get a look at, when we cut it open, you can see there's that green, irregular-shaped, wedge-type bone that is the sphenoid bone. If we look at the skull in sagittal section, it actually gives you a good idea of where the inferior nasal conche is, those scroll-shaped bones that we uh, spoke of. And we're looking also at the relationship between the, uh, the sphenoid bone, and we can see a couple of the sinuses, which are holes in the skull. And we can also see the relationship between the uh, mandible and the maxilla and the temporal mandibular joint. This is the skull of the infant showing the uh, soft spots. Notice the um, anterior fontanelle and the posterior fontanelle and also the mastoid fontanelle. Uh, these, are, these fontanelles or soft spots eventually close up and that's where you have your different sutures being formed. Notice that the parietal bone actually is still in two pieces here to allow for the passage of the child through the birth canal and also for uh, the growth of the brain. Let's talk about the framework of the trunk. We have the vertebral column. Our seven cervical vertebrae make up the neck. Then we have 12 thoracic vertebrae that make up the chest region of the vertebral column, and five lumbar vertebrae that make up the lower back. Uh, we have the sacrum or sacral vertebrae, which are actually five fused vertebrae. In the sacrum, the, um, the vertebrae are actually fused. And the coccygeal vertebrae, the coccyx itself, is the tailbone, which is made up of four vertebrae that are actually fused together. Um, if you remember the number 7, 12, 5, 5, 4, you will remember the uh, divisions of the vertebral column, 7, 12, 5, 5, 4. That's important because when physicians are charting, they will note uh, injuries between, say for example, C3 and C4, and you should know that is the uh, third and fourth cervical vertebrae, or they might note a disc herniation between L3 and L4. So you should know that those are the um, third and fourth lumbar vertebrae, respectively. The thorax is made up of the sternum, or the breastbone, and 12 ribs. We have the first seven ribs that attach directly to the sternum via cartilage. These are cartilaginous joints. And if you look in your diagram of the skeleton in your textbook, they're actually any cartilaginous joints. For example, the ones in the ribs and the pubic symphysis, they're light blue to indicate that they're cartilage. So the true ribs attach to the sternum. The false ribs actually attach to other ribs that attach to the sternum. And we have two floating ribs that are not attached to the sternum at all. The sternum itself is um, made up of the manubrium. So we're basically starting from the top of the sternum. We have the stern, sternal notch, 
or some people call it the clavicular notch. If you run your fingers down your throat to where it meets the chest, you can actually find that notch yourself that some textbooks call it the clavicular notch. However, I believe the sternal notch is much more common. You have the body of the sternum itself, that's the larger part. And when you go all the way down, you have a hanging piece of cartilage called the xiphoid process. Again, remembering that processes are important points of attachments for uh, tendons and ligaments, the xiphoid process is important. But it's also um, notable that the xiphoid process in cases of severe trauma, as you would have in a patient who has had significant impact with the steering wheel, the chest has significant impact with the steering wheel, the xiphoid process itself is a triangular, almost pointed type of process that can actually bend inward and lacerate the liver, lacerate meaning uh, give the liver a jagged cut and the uh, person can slowly bleed out. Let's talk about the discs in the uh, vertebral column. They're basically placed between each vertebra and they're there for cushioning. They're made of cartilage. They separate the vertebra and uh, in cases of poor mechanics, uh, they're prone to slippage or herniation. You may have heard this term, uh, slipped disc or herniated disc um, before. We will deal with that particular topic a little bit later on, but we want to make you aware of the function of the intervertebral discs. Here is a diagram of the vertebral column itself. Moving on to the next slide, we see that each vertebra is slightly different. Um, there are different processes, spinous processes, transverse processes, etc., that come out of a body of a vertebra. The processes are various points of attachment, again, for um, tendons. But the body of the uh, vertebra itself in between those bodies of the vertebra is where we have our intervertebral discs. The one thing that is not illustrated in this diagram is a part of the vertebra called the lamina. The lamina actually, if there's a disc herniation, the nerve root that comes out of the spinal cord itself can be caught between the herniated disc and the lamina itself in order to alleviate this uh, any kind of pinching or pain that the patient may have uh, a surgical procedure called a laminectomy may be done here we see the uh, rib cage and we see the sternal notch, the manubrium, uh, the body of the sternum, and the xiphoid process. Here's our checkpoint. It says the axial skeleton consists of bones of the skull and trunk. What bones make up the skeleton of the trunk? We just learned that and that's something that you can review. And our another checkpoint, what are the five regions of the vertebral column? Next, we talk about the appendicular skeleton, and there are two divisions, the upper extremities and the lower extremities. In the upper extremities, we have what's called a shoulder girdle. A girdle is a, is a structure that uh, surrounds and protects uh, other structures, okay? Uh, so we have the clavicle, uh, which is the collarbone, and the scapula. So we have also the supraspinous fossa and the infraspinous fossa. Um, these are good terms to know. However, for our purposes, we don't need to be concerned with them. The acromion and the glenoid cavity. Um, the acromion 
is a landmark that we use for when we're administering intramuscular injections and deltoid. You can actually feel the acrominon and you feel two finger spaces down from there. And that's approximately where you'd give an intramuscular shot in the shoulder. The glenoid cavity is basically the space that the head of the humerus fits into. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the shoulder girdle. A girdle is a structure that surrounds and supports other structures. Girdles are usually weight bearing structures. In the body, we have the shoulder girdle, but we also have the pelvic girdle as well. The clavicle is the collarbone. The scapula is the shoulder blade. In the shoulder blade, there are two different fossas. The acromignon is actually a landmark that is used when intramuscular injections are being administered about two finger spaces down from the acromion, uh, that's about where you'd give a intramuscular injection in the shoulder. The glenoid cavity is the space in which the head of the humerus sits. And notice uh, the structure of the shoulder girdle. Everything that we have mentioned including the clavicle, the humerus, which of course is the um, bone of the upper arm that fits into that uh, glenoid cavity. So we continue with the upper division of the appendicular skeleton. The humerus, of course, is the bone of the upper arm. There are medial and lateral epicondyles for the humerus. Uh, there's also a trochlea. These are all bone markings that we, for our purposes, do not have to be too concerned with. The ulna and radius are the two bones of the forearm. And um, the olecranon is actually a projection of the ulna that forms the elbow. The carpal bones, there are eight of them. These are the bones that make up the wrists. The metacarpal bones are the bones that make up the hand and the phalanges make up the fingers. We have a question here to check your understanding. Where is the olecranon? And the answer is on the next slide. It's the proximal end of the ulna. What is the anatomic term for fingers and toes? And the answer here is on the next slide. It is phalanges. In the lower division of the appendicular skeleton, we have the ilium, which we know is the hip bone. Uh, one of the major landmarks is the iliac crest. Uh, a crest is a rounded ridge-like structure. The, the ischium is the bone that you sit on. The pubis is made up of the uh, pubic symphysis which again is a cartilaginous joint. And the acetabulum is the space that the head of the femur sits in. Here we have a diagram illustrating the uh, pelvic bones or the pelvic girdle. Note the uh, sacrum, the iliac crest, and the anterior iliac spine. Note the acetabulum, which is where the head of the femur fit, uh, sits, and the pubic arch, and the pubic symphysis. We have a comparison of the male and the female pelvis. If you note that the pubic arch is wider in females, and also the pelvic girdle itself is much wider in females to facilitate childbirth. Also, uh, the pubic symphysis separates slightly during childbirth and in cases of autopsy, 
or where a forensic anthropologist has discovered only bones, they can tell based on the shape of the pelvis and the pelvic arch whether or not the body is male or female and they can also tell whether or not that female has given birth depending on the condition of the pubic symphysis. The lower division of the appendicular skeleton is continued. We're going to talk about the lower extremity and the largest and strongest bone in the body is the femur. Uh, the illustration talks about a couple of bone markings, the greater trochanter, the lesser trochanter, and so on. Uh, these are good to note, but it's nothing that you're going to be tested on. Um, the patella is actually the kneecap. The tibia is the shin bone. It is actually on the medial aspect of the lower leg. The fibula is on the lateral aspect of the lower leg. Note that both the tibia and fibula have malleoli or a medial malleolus in the tibia and a lateral malleolus um, on the fibula. The malleoli are actually projections that can be seen in the lower part of the foot and that is what, that is what people call their ankles. The bones that actually make up the ankles are the tarsal bones. Of the tarsal bones, the largest tarsal bone is the calcaneus, and that is the bone that forms the heel. The metatarsal bones form the foot, and the phalanges form the toes. Here we have a diagram illustrating the femur. Note the head and neck of the femur. The head of the femur actually fits into the acetabulum. Note the neck of the femur and the greater trochanter. Usually when a person has a hip fracture, especially due to osteoporosis, it involves either the acetabulum, the head of the femur, the neck of the femur, or a crack in the greater trochanter. Here we have a diagram illustrating the lower leg. Notice we have the tibia on the medial aspect of the lower leg and the fibula on the lateral aspect of the lower leg. And notice the size difference in the tibia and fibula. That concludes our survey of the skeletal system. And now we're going to talk about specialties related to the skeletal system. A chiropractor or a doctor of chiropractic is somebody that has earned a DC degree after four years of schooling and they're specialized in spinal manipulation. They can be very useful to help relieve some of the pain and pressure associated with herniated discs and other problems related to musculoskeletal issues of the back. An osteopathic surgeon is usually an MD or even a DO that is specialized in bones and uh, surgical repair of bones. An osteopath, however, is a different type of physician. He's not an MD, but he's a DO. Um, DOs can go into any specialty, even, they're, even though they're called osteopaths, they don't necessarily have to specialize in anything related to bone. Their, their training is very similar to a regular physician, except DO schools emphasize musculoskeletal relationships, and DO schools also emphasize um, trying to enhance the body's natural healing process. I would say about 95% of the training of a DO is very similar to that of an MD. An MD is called an allopath. They, pr they practice allopathic medicine.
that a DO is called an osteopath, even though an osteopath can specialize in any branch of medicine, cardiology, dermatology, what have you, their training does emphasize some muscular skeletal relationships. A podiatrist is basically a foot doctor. Um, they have their own schools and they have attained the degree of doctor of podiatric medicine, DPM. A rheumatologist is a physician that specializes in treating joint disorders. Um, some rheumatologists specialize in just arthritis. There are about a hundred different types of arthrigides, which is the plural for the word arthritis.